Happy Sabbath, everybody. We're so glad for all of you here, those of you online, we welcome you as well. And uh, I just feel so good today. I feel like um, God's presence is just knocking at all of our doors and, and he's so happy. He's filled with gifts and presents and surprises. And he, he, you know when you have this really neat gift for your child or someone you really care about and you can't wait to give it to them, you're so excited, you know they're going to love it. And God is at our door just going, oh, I hope they're home. <laughs> I hope they answer because I've got some great stuff to share with them. Oh, they're going to be so happy. I just think God is at the doors of our hearts, each of our homes the, the door of the church to our sanctuary going, oh, I can't wait to be with you today. I have so many good gifts. Let's pray. Lord, I, I always pray before sermons and, and uh, always feel filled up, ready to go. But today I just have this extra special sense that you are with us, and so joyfully so, and so eagerly so, wanting to enter our hearts and, and just uh, lavish these gifts upon us. And in turn, we want to lavish our praise and our love for you. We want to glorify you to the uttermost. Let that happen today, Holy Spirit. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to Mark chapter 4. And as you head there, I want to tell you, oh, you know what? I always forget this. All right, we've got a, thank you, Frank. Leave that maybe up there after the songs. That would be so helpful. All right. On Boxing Day, you know what Boxing Day is, right? The day after Christmas where they do their presents in some of these UK countries. On Boxing Day, December 26, 2004, a 9.1 earthquake struck 9 miles, 19 miles, beneath the surface of the Indian Ocean, creating a 900-mile-long rupture along its fault lines. The impact of the crashing tectonic plates in that area was so massive that the earth, the entire earth, wobbled on its axis enough so that every day hence will be a fraction of a second shorter. Not noticeable to us, but tiny bulge, the shape of the earth has actually changed. It's just a little bit bigger at its bulge. Again, you'd never see it, but microscopically it's there. In some places though, it was noticeable. The seafloor suddenly rose as high as 130 feet, creating a what? Tsunami, whose waves began to spread out at the speed of a passenger jet. The waves reached as high as 100 feet in some places, bringing sudden death, unfortunately, to more than a quarter million people. The devastation spread out among 14 countries across two continents with the last two, this is hard to believe, with the last two fatalities being swept out to sea all the way in South Africa more than 12 hours after the quake first struck. They are victims of the tsunami and quake as well. It was the third largest quake in recorded history and had the longest duration of faulting ever observed between eight and 10 minutes. Unbelievable. Now, before we go further, just so we understand, before we launch into our Bible story, what's the difference between a tsunami and a tidal wave? Well, growing up as a kid, uh, and I think a lot of people have this, tidal waves are often depicted as some huge wave engulfing the coast. Isn't that the idea you got growing up? A uh, huge wave. And you remember these tidal waves, right? You remember these? Um, the one on the left there 
The one on the left was almost 300 feet high, caused by a malfunctioning wave pool at a water park. <laughs> Don't believe the crazy Photoshop depictions all over the internet or the ideas that some people have about tidal waves. Don't believe the pastor about them either. Tidal waves are caused by gravitational forces, just like the tides at the beach. And you can get some pretty big ones. The Bay of Fundy, uh, what is that, 50 plus feet when that tide rolls in and out. But that's gravitational. Uh, tidal waves are usually predictable, but they can cause some damage and flooding at times. But this is real. These folks here, I don't know if you could see it clearly enough. Candy, what are they doing? This is a real picture, not Photoshop. They're surfing a tidal wave. So now you know the, the exaggerations about tidal waves engulfing cities are not true. Of course, they can be much bigger than that, but that, that is real. Uh, in reality, however, tsunamis are much bigger because they're actually successive waves that build on each other, and they're capable of far more death and destruction and producing tall waves as well. Last week, we spoke about fires. Today, tsunamis. Are you beginning to see a trend? I decided to make this into a short two-part summer series. So today is Dealing with Disaster, part two. And today's message is entitled, Surviving Soul Tsunamis. Surviving Soul Tsunamis. This is going to be interesting. How many of you believe that a tsunami is recorded in the Bible? Most of us aren't sure uh, about that. Um, we might say Noah's flood. Noah's flood, right? However, that was Noah's flood. <laughs> but there likely were tsunamis occurring at the time, no doubt, I believe. So where else could we find a tsunami in Scripture? Well, some scholars believe there was actually one in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, I think we're already there. Since early morning, Jesus had been teaching nonstop. And as the day began to wind down, his human frame was spent, exhausted. So Jesus thought it a good idea to sail with his disciples across the Sea of Galilee, away from the crowds, where they could spend a quiet evening of rest and sleep. As soon as they boarded, Jesus grabbed a cushion for his head, stretched out on the stern of the vessel, and fell fast asleep as the, the disciples set course for the other side of the lake. And as you know, some miles in, they suddenly encountered a ferocious what? Lion? Tiger? Or storm, right? A ferocious storm. Now, if it had been a usual storm, they would have sailed through it with relative ease. However, this storm was anything but usual. In fact, I want to repeat, as we alluded to earlier, some believe, I didn't say I believed it, but some believe that they had gotten caught in a tsunami. Now, is that just traumatic not traumatic, is that just dramatic storytelling? Or is there any evidence for this? Well, actually, there is. They just didn't pull it out of a hat. There is some. Strangely enough, Mark doesn't use the Greek word that's normally given for storm. Instead, he chose the word seismos. Does that sound familiar to you at all? What word do we get from seismos? Seismograph, right? Uh, uh, the writing that uh, measures the uh, earthquake. It literally means earthquake. So a storm is a storm. But if it quakes, 
like a quake, <laughs> right? It just might be one. Well, just as there was a quake in the bottom of the Indian Ocean, taking Mark literally from the literal Greek, he'd be telling us there was a quake on the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. And as we have seen, earthquakes can produce large waves or tsunamis. Another interesting point uh, is that the Sea of Galilee lies on a huge geological fault line that runs from southern Turkey all the way to South Africa or southern Africa. And earthquakes in Palestine are common, some with great destruction. destruction. These are some ancient samples because they're closer to Bible times. They're just a sampling. But several of these quakes have caused great destruction in Jerusalem, Judea, Palestine, and many famous quakes on the sea of Ga in the area of Galilee. And there have been many tsunamis throughout the centuries that, that uh, were created uh, by quakes, and the tsunamis came up to the coast from what body of water? The Mediterranean. The Mediterranean. All right, so they have a long history of major quakes. In any case, the waves were so high here that verse 37 says, they broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped, or as Luke says, the boat was filling up. Now, let's be fair. Those who doubt the tsunami evidence say it was clearly a storm because, verse 37 says, a great windstorm came up, and that's what produced the large waves. And here, I'm just going to give you just a very quick exercise in the futility of uh, Bible interpretation. Here it goes. We have some options here in this story, and commentators can be all over the place. We have wind as a possibility for generating the waves, right? That's what the... the the translations generally give the idea. Or an earthquake causing a series of waves like a tsunami. That's what we found in the original Greek. Or maybe Mark used the word seismos because the storm was so bad, the sea appeared to be violently shaking like a quake. And that's what most would agree with. But I thought of a fourth option that I didn't find in any commentary. There could have been a great wind, as described, on top of a quake that caused a series of waves, which would have put the disciples and Jesus in a, in a kind of even uh, uh, double jeopardy, right? Two, two dangerous situations. However, no matter what we believe about the meteorological or geological theories, the result is the same, right? The waves towering above the deck of their small boat would be a fearsome sight. Have you ever watched the Discovery Channel or any of these shows that show these rogue waves or these ships at sea? It, 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 just a fearsome sight. All right, and here's where I want to go today. We don't have to be facing a literal disaster at sea. We have our own spiritual soul tsunamis where we feel as if life is flooding our dreams, smashing us up against the rocks again and again, and escape looks impossible. Have you ever been so overwhelmed you've felt like you'll never make it back to shore? Have you ever had an experience like that emotionally, spiritually, maybe even physically? Well, I want to repeat a story I once told early on, but I think a lot of folks weren't here, but I want to give it a different application today. We're talking about the, the times when you feel like you're struggling, you're, you're in your own personal soul tsunami, and and you're not sure. Remember how many, those horrible pictures of that uh, Boxing Day tsunami, all those people that got swept out. Um, 
we can feel like that, can't we? Emotionally, spiritually, like how am I ever going to make it back to the shore? The odds are so much against it. Well, Marie and I had gone to Hawaii for a pastoral interview. And before things got started, we asked someone, we thought they were trustworthy. It was the son of the owner of the hotel right there in Waikiki to tell us the best place to go snorkeling. Well, we were sent to a beautiful beach called Makapu. Those of you who've traveled to Oahu, the gathering place, have you ever been to Makapu, anyone? Beautiful, beautiful beach. Uh, Makapu Lighthouse is there. There's a trail uh, looking this side toward there. Very beautiful. Well, we went to Makapu, but I've got to tell you that I'm not a good swimmer, and I tend to sink like a rock, and I had never snorkeled before. But it's Hawaii. <laughs> so you just have to be stupid and try it. <laughs> So stupid loves to go try things that they shouldn't because uh, it looked too, uh, too much. I just had to do it. Well, we made it through the rough surf, and the crazy thing is, at Makapu, the waves rise up and often they, they vertically jump and they smash on the sand. And there's a beach on the other side called Sandy Beach where Sometimes, about once a year, someone breaks their neck, their cervical column, because the waves sn snap so hard on the sand. Well, we made it through the rough surf, um, and time is elapsing uh, pretty quick, and before I know it, I'm looking down through my mask, not seeing anything, because why? It's so deep and dark. I'm not seeing a thing. I'm going, well, this isn't very fun. But I peek up and realize I've drifted far out, really far. And for a person who doesn't swim well, and I know nothing about snorkeling, I don't know how to float, I, I know nothing. And, uh, but I, I was just so enchanted with the idea of seeing fish in the water, I threw caution to the wind. And so can you imagine someone who doesn't know how to swim well, they're so far out there in that bay, and it's deep, dark, there's cliffs, you can't see them, but there's pretty steep uh, cliffs uh, on the side of me. I'm, I'm very close to them. Well, I'm, I'm tempted to freak out, but I, I, I don't, I, but I do realize this, that I, the current is so strong, I think it was a riptide, if not, it was just so strong, I just couldn't make my way back. I tried and tried and got more and more exhausted, and uh, I just thought to myself, you know what, this really could be the end because Maria, she's a fish, and um, she doesn't need human food. I just sprinkle some fish food flakes on her. Very cheap, you know, to have a wife like that. And she, she just goes like that with her pectoral fins, takes some fish, and swims fish food and swims off. She's a little, she could swim like you can't believe. She could survive a, being swept out to sea. She's such a good swimmer. Well, she's off exploring, and I'm yelling, Maria, Maria, they're, 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 no, I can't be heard, and I'm, I'm, I'm just more and more exhausted, and at that point, I tell you what I do. I take out my human calculator. Have you ever done this? It's gonna, you're going to, I think, identify with this more and more. I take out my human calculator calculator, and I punch in a few assumptions, a few fears, <laughs> and I'm punching away, and it's amazing how fast it spits out the answer, I'll tell you. My human calculator tells me that there's no possible way that I can make it back to shore. The current is too strong. So I begin thinking, yep, 
this is very likely the end because I don't know how to float at that point. I, I just know nothing. And I'm just too tired. I, I can't, I don't know where Maria is. And just as I'm going, I just, I just can't keep doing this, Maria comes back and she's skimming through the water like a dolphin, I'll add, and she, just, she sees I'm in trouble and she says, follow me. I'm going, what? What are we going to do now? Follow you. Well, she knew to swim which way? Sideways to the beach until we were outside of the rip tide. And I was able to really easily swim back in. I mean, much more easily. We later discovered we had gotten some really bad advice. No one snorkels off that beach. Nobody. It's, it's too dangerous. It's too uh, dark and deep. And the currents are too strong. You can't see anything anyway when you're way out. It's just crazy. But you see, when I punched the numbers, my human calculator told me I had about a 1% chance making it in. That's what my human calculator told me. I couldn't think of anything at the moment. Oh, about I didn't know about riptides. I didn't know about anything. I just thought that's it, because that's what my human calculator told me with my fears and my assumptions and my narrow experience. I punched that data in, and that's what came out. That's what spit out. But I have a question. Does it happen? Do those with the 1% odds ever make it? Just last weekend, in a major golf championship, Justin Thomas woke up on Sunday morning so far back from the leaders that one projection gave him just a 1.2% chance of winning. But by the end of the day, he got back to the top and won a playoff. In an interview afterward, he admitted that it was 1.2% more of a chance than he would have given himself. But he won despite his human calculator, amen? He won despite his human calculator. And think about it, if God depended on human calculations, Jesus would have sent all the people home instead of feeding the 5,000 with just a few loaves and fish, right? Amen? If Jesus had no other way, if he was limited by our human calculations, then Lazarus and all the others never would have risen from the grave. If Jesus had no other way to build his church, then through our calculations, then the early church may have turned over an apple cart, but not the world. So the testimony of Scripture and Christian history is more than enough proof that our most menacing disasters don't mean the end of us with God at our side. Do you believe that? They do not mean the end of us with God at our side. And there's plenty of evidence of that right here in Mark 4. After the disciples woke Jesus, verse 39 says, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Now here's an interesting insight into the Greek. The Greek is a little stronger, but it doesn't sound as nice. So the translators subdued it a bit, sanded off the edges. In the Greek, it sounds more like, Hush, cut it out. Settle down. <laughs> I, love, I love that. There were, he spoke with authority. And then it says the wind died down and it was a little bit calmer. Isn't that nice? 50% calmer. What does it actually say? Completely calm. Not a little bit, not 50%, not halfway. Completely calm. What does that tell us? Jesus has the power to completely calm our troubled hearts. And that's great news, isn't it? 
to completely calm our troubled hearts and our own soul tsunamis. What would the odds makers think about it? What would the odds makers have said about a human calming a furious storm just by speaking to it? What would they have said? They would have said, impossible, can't be done. They're doomed for sure. But the great news is the impossible becomes possible with God because nothing is too hard for him. Hallelujah. Amen. I just love that. Well, I, I want to be sympathetic because I've had my own soul tsunamis. It, everything we've said so far can be hard to believe when you're right in the middle of your own soul tsunami. Is that fair to say? When you're feeling like you're swept out to sea and there's no way back, it's somewhat hard to believe that. For example, what do you feel at the beach when a wave knocks you down or pummels you across the ocean floor? And, and uh, what are you really feeling? What you're really feeling is the force physically of the weight of the wave, right? Now, you may be feeling emotionally terrified <laughs> uh, and all of that, but physically you're feeling the force of the weight of the wave. In Hawaii, they hold surf tournaments, as you'd imagine, and they have a famous one called the Eddy uh, Surf Tournament. has a whole story behind that, but I once went, 2011, it was a record-breaking year. The waves were so high uh, that it was one of the highest they had ever seen. And so uh, it, it was fascinating to go out there and watch. Well, I couldn't believe how they could survive wiping out. And because when you wipe out, you are pummeled underneath, and sometimes you stay down and sometimes there is rock there I, I just don't know how they do it there's rocks all around there just amazing to me but uh i want you to understand something those waves that i saw were 40 to 50 feet think about this just taking a 33 foot high wave that's 66 feet wide means that if you wipe out you'll feel the equivalent of 900,000 pounds or the weight of 488 1967 model Volkswagen Beetles smashing against you. Who would enjoy something like that today? Who's up for that? No, that, that, that's what you feel like. Just a small 20-inch wave can knock you down with the force of 1,100 pounds. But here's the truth. Sometimes life comes at us with pressures that rival that of the biggest waves. Is that true? The pressure, the weight that we feel. So the next time you're gasping for breath amidst your own soul tsunami, remember we have promises like Psalm 29.10. The Lord rules over the flood waters. Isn't that beautiful? He's the one who rules over them. The Lord gives his people strength and he, gives, he blesses them with peace. The implication is from this, when you're caught in the flood waters, God is so big that he can give you strength and peace until he pulls you out of them because he rules over them. Isn't that great? It's not just that God has the pleasure and privilege of not being affected by the floods, he's telling us he can give us strength and peace even amidst our floods until he pulls us out. I think that's great news. Um, and then, let me ask you this. Where do tsunami evacuation routes lead you to? To higher ground, right? To higher ground. Uh, you know what? When life gets really big, God is always bigger. Amen? When life gets big, God is always bigger. Psalm 61 says, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. 
even spiritual evacu evacuation routes lead us to the rock that is higher than I. All right, now, there's more good news in the text. Despite their lack of faith, uh, their fear and lack of trust, you know what I love? Jesus still delivered them. You know what? Uh, and so many people know, well, you know what? If, if you're good enough, if you come up to speed, whatever, you can do this or that. Despite, these are Jesus' representatives. They're going to build this church, right? Despite their fear and lack of trust, Jesus still delivered them. Just apply that to your life any time that you are wavering. Our weakness doesn't prevent God from saving us. Isn't that beautiful? Our weaknesses don't prevent him from helping us. And you know the story. That's why I didn't look it up. Jesus rebuked two things here. He rebuked the wind, and he also chided who? He rebuked the wind and the waves and the disciples, right? But he didn't rebuke them for what they did. He rebuked them for what they said. First, what did they actually do? They turned to Jesus. And it's always right to turn to Jesus. Amen? That's beautiful. They turned to Jesus. Even, even when we're panic-stricken with fear, we should be like the disciples and turn to Jesus. That's always a good thing, right? All right? So Jesus didn't rebuke them for turning to him. He rebuked them because of what they said. Do you remember what they said? Lord, don't you care that we perish? Lord, don't you care for us? Don't you care that we're going to die here? What hurt Jesus the most was their doubting his love and care for them after all he had already lavished upon them. I've got to tell you, whatever you do in life, you... The, the, the way to always get out of your soul tsunami, never, never doubt that Jesus loves and cares for you. Amen. Never doubt that. Just keep that. I don't care what happens. Um, I don't care how I'm feeling. I don't care how I'm suffering. I know Jesus loves and cares for me. That's how I do it. That's how I cope with whatever I go through in life. I know that no matter what, Jesus loves and cares for me. And the cross is the ultimate proof that he'll get you through your hardest soul tsunamis. In 1958, a man named Ulrich and his eight-year-old son were anchored in Alaska's Latuya Bay when shortly after 10 p.m. at night, an 8.0 earthquake struck the area so hard it was felt as far south as Seattle. Unbelievable. Two people on a little island died when it suddenly dropped more than 20 feet into the water. The stories from this quake are so unbelievable. Look it up, research. You won't believe what happened as a result, but I'm focused here. The two to three minute quake caused a colossal block of rock and ice measuring about a half mile square and about 300 feet thick to crack free from the mountain and plunge 3,000 feet into the bay where this father and son were anchored. The 40 million cubic yards of rock, ice, and dirt caused a violent impact in the water that was heard like an explosion 50 miles to the north. The quake had moved, geologists later determined, the quake had moved the mountain 21 feet forward and three feet upward, a whole mountain. From two miles away, Oryx saw a huge wave caused by that massive landslide screaming toward them at 100 miles an hour. He handed a life jacket to his son and told him to pray. There seemed no way of surviving. 
He got out his human calculator. He put in his, his quickly his fears, his assumptions, right? And he said, this is it. So he got on the radio crying out, Mayday, Mayday, I think we've had it in Latuya Bay. Goodbye. Their anchor was stuck because of the movement of the quake in the rocks. So all he could do was to turn their boat into the face of a 50 to 75 foot wave coming right at them. Can you imagine? The wave hit them and fortunately severed, immediately severed the chain. It was a 200 something foot, 250 foot chain. It immediately severed it. Uh, the waves carried the boat far inland above the tree tops of trees above the treetops and the tree line, way above them. He was convinced there'd be a terrible crash, but then they were pulled out from above the trees, back into the churning waters, shaken but unhurt. Again, the stories are so amazing, you just look it up. But I'll tell you this, they had survived what is known as a mega tsunami. A mega tsunami because in other parts of the bay, the overrun effect of the waves was so great that it reached a height of 1,720 feet. We think 100-foot waves are like, oh man, I never want to see the face of that uh, wave lip coming down. 1,720 feet, the highest tsunami ever recorded. Now, here are photos of some of the scarring. Remember, it's 1958 black and white photos. Do you see how uh, the water's just stripped, uh, scraped away the trees uh, from that side of, of the rock? Just amazing power and force. Folks, the best thing to do if a tsunami strikes, as we said earlier, is to head to where? To higher ground. And if you feel like your faith can't reach that high, well, as we've just seen, God can even use the disaster itself to lift you up to safety. Whatever your soul tsunami, be like the disciples and turn to Jesus, even if it's in fear, and he will calm your soul he will calm your soul even if he doesn't immediately calm the storm. Isn't that great news? That's what I got out of this familiar story this week. I looked at it again. I said, you know what? I know he could calm the storms, but what I struggle with is that fear in the midst. And I saw it this week. He could calm your soul. He could calm your soul even if he doesn't immediately calm the storm. And I think that's great news for us today. Let's praise him together in song for being a shelter in the time of storm. <laughs> 